presents Pastor Earl Jones on the subject, God's Rules for War. Pastor Earl Jones. We as devout Christians know that this is the Holy Word of God. This is the book that we as Christians are supposed to read diligently and understand as completely as we are permitted and allowed to do so and as we are capable of doing. Now, if that be the case, we must realize that there are many messages in this Bible, in this Word of God, that we do not hear in our usual sermons at the church down on the corner. And yet, it's got to be a part of God's Word. We, therefore, I believe we must go down into the nooks and crannies of the Word of God and find those things that we must know He has written, He wants us to know, and yet uh, we haven't spoken of, uh, spoken too much of in the Christian churches of today. And yet they must be said. The title of my message today is God's Rule for Warfare. The very famous song, Onward Christian Soldiers, continues with marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Now, just what do those words mean? Another equally famous song is the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which starts out with, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Now, here we are in these two songs, singing about the same God, and they are saying the same thing. In Revelations chapter 19 and in verse 11, we read, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now, the sweet Jesus of the New Testament is the same as the old bearded man of the Old Testament. He is the rock. He is the Lord of hosts, or the Lord of war, or battles. Now, since Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17 and 18 said that the laws of the Old Testament were still in effect, and he said exactly that, and since he is the Lord of hosts and he doth judge and make war, we as his people Israel must look at the rules that he has established for making war. They are not very complicated, but each of his principles have a definite purpose. If we follow his principles, we will be victorious. If we don't follow those principles, we will fail. His kingdom was established at Mount Sinai, and that kingdom, the house of Jacob, is the one over which the angel declared to Mary that Jesus is to rule and reign. Each of us must look into his mirror, his own heart, into his mind, and realize that it is a privilege for the citizens of that kingdom to defend it against all attacks by all enemies, both foreign and domestic. Now, those enemies are those who seek to destroy that government and his kingdom. Now, we all know of Christ's two-edged sword. In Revelations chapter 1 and verse 16, and out of his mouth went a two-edged sword. Now, some of the renditions of the Bible, some of the, the uh, versions of the Bible will say that out in his right hand was a two-edged sword. Now, we all in Christianity know that the sword means his word. But we have to look a little bit deeper because he always talks about a two-edged sword with respect to that word. It is always with respect to a two-edged sword. What do we mean? It is my opinion that one edge of that two-edged sword is the law, and the other edge 
is the judgment. Now for us to understand what is meant by this, we need a companion verse or two. In Matthew 7 and verse 1, we read this. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now, when you judge, you must judge in accordance with the laws of God. We are allowed to do this. That's the entire purpose of the Bible. That is the entire purpose why the laws and statutes and judgments are given to us. You are judging against a standard. You are in a position, if you agree with this concept, you must understand and that you accept that the laws of God are a standard. Now, if that be a case, if you agree that the same standard is to be used in judgment by you, you must agree that those standards must be used in judgment for your actions. There is another verse in the uh, Bible that is a companion to the two-edged sword of God. In the 26th chapter of Matthew, 2652, Jesus said, for all they that take the sword shall perish by the sword. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus said that we were never to pick up a sword, because if we were to believe that, then we would be making, uh, giving a contradiction in Jesus' own words, and we know that can't be right. If we go to Luke 22 and chapter 36, Jesus directed his disciples that those who did not have a sword go and sell his cloak and buy one. So you see, he doesn't mean that we are not to have a sword. It means that when we pick up the sword in judgment against Israel's enemies, we are judging in accordance with God's laws. Now again, the two-edged sword, if that be the case, it also means that we understand and accept the laws of God and we accept the thought that we will be judged accordingly by God using enemy forces when we fail to meet his laws. Now, to me, that is exactly the position that this nation of Israel, the United States of America, finds itself today because we have sinned and we have failed as a nation to f meet and comply with God's laws, statutes, and judgments, we have enemy forces judging us and punish punishing us by God Almighty. Now, we can find the promise that God made us in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and in verse 7, which says that when his people are right with him, the Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and, the, and, fl and flee before thee seven ways. But when we are not right with God and we are refusing to keep his commandments, statutes, and judgments, the Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. And we find that in the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy, verse 25. We will win in any conflict, not because the enemies have sinned, but because we are righteous. We will lose in any conflict, not because the enemies are righteous, but because we have sinned. It's as simple as that. Not, uh, God's fulfillment of his promises when his people are doing all that he requires of them is found in the book of Exodus, chapter 23, and in verses 22 and 23. Then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies, and an adversary unto thine adversaries, for mine angel shall go before thee, in Leviticus, chapter 26, verse 8. Five of you shall, shall, shall chase an hundred, and an hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. Now, in my 
message today, I will show the several rules for warfare that God has given us. And this is rule number one, get right with God. Now, what that means is that we as individuals are supposed to take all of the rules, the regulations, the laws, statutes, and judgments that we find in His Word, and we should comply with them. It doesn't mean only that we are to come out on that aisle and get on our hands and knees and crawl up to the altar and, and uh, do it in this manner. That is not all that that means. What this means is that we must get right with God by living, breathing, working, and teaching His law, statutes, and judgments. Now, also, it doesn't mean necessarily just you and I as individuals. We are talking about a nation. You and I as individuals are just a part of Israel. So we must think of this as a national message. We must think of this as a collective situation. As we continue in discussing the rules for warfare, we will see how this fits with the two-edged sword of law and judgment. It is proper and righteous that we judge, but we must have a set of standards against which we can judge. We are not supposed to go out and judge what you, what, what you and I think is wrong, right or wrong. We are supposed to do it what, in accordance with what God thinks is right or wrong. When our forefathers founded this Christian nation, they judged individual and corporate actions in accordance with the standards that God Almighty presented to the kingdom at Mount Sinai, and as a result, this nation was blessed. There is no question about this. All we need to do is to read our history books. Then it was the new breed of Judaized Christian ministers that simply came forth and taught, judge not, lest ye be judged. And they didn't know what they were saying. I just wonder if they really did or didn't know what they were saying. After much study, I find that in many, many of the cases, they do know what they are saying. As a result of this, we have wound up with a nation of Judeo-Christians, each doing his own thing. We are not required in modern America to abide by the laws, statutes, and judgments, and we are paying the price. Now, since we are discussing God, God's rules for warfare against an enemy or enemies of our Christian people, we need to define what is meant by an enemy. An enemy is a foe or adversary who is unfriendly or seeks to harm. It is an antagonist who desires to overcome another using every means at his command to accomplish his purpose. When uh, Israel goes to war, it is against a people who are hostile and unfriendly with a malicious purpose. The Constitution of the United States of America is completely within the meaning of God's law on this matter, and it defines treason to include giving aid and comfort to our enemies, both foreign and domestic. This is officially a Christian nation, and it has been so determined by the Supreme Court on three separate occasions. Now, it would f follow by deductive reasoning, and this is very simple deductive reasoning, that any person or group that gives aid, financial or otherwise, and or comfort to any organization or individual who seeks to make this country into a pluralistic society and to change it into another religion's code of conduct is by definition an enemy, since this is a Christian nation. As you can readily see, this once great Christian nation is a long, long way down the road to oblivion. But 
Be of strong heart. Keep your belief in God. Remember the old saying, God plus one is a majority. But brother and sister, that is only true if that one realizes this. He must realize that he, along with God, makes a majority. Five of you shall chase an hundred, and an hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight, and your enemies shall fall, uh, fall before you by the sword. So what are the rules? We have already stated the first and foremost rule. Our people must get right with God. All of the rest of rules for warfare pale by comparison to this one. Rule number two, all godly wars are defensive in nature. And we must define this. We are not to make an aggressive war. Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 16 specifically disallowed the kings of Israel to have numerous horses. He says this, but he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. You see, numerous horses mean chariots, and chariots meant aggression. Now, in today's terminology, we must have weapons for attack because the best defense is a good offense. And likewise, in those days in Israel, Israel went on the attack, as we shall see in a moment. You see, though, going on the attack in a defensive posture and comparing that, you cannot compare that with a war of aggression where you start the war. God defined a righteous war when he told Noah, whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. And both of these words, man here, is number 120, which is derived from 119 in Strong's Concordance, and we are speaking of Adamic man. Aggression is to be resisted, and bloodshed of Adamic man is to be avenged. The fundamental right of self-defense is found in Exodus, the 22nd chapter, and in verse 2. And this is best shown in the New American Standard Edition of the Holy Bible. If the thief is caught while breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there will be no blood guiltiness on his account. Now the phrase, while breaking in, would be the same whether it is your home or your country or your Christian way of life. There are predefined boundaries in the kingdom of God. You must also consider the idea that defensive warfare has these predefined boundaries. It is a group or person that is attempting to redefine the boundaries of your nation from within or from without. That is a definite sign of aggress aggressive warfare against you and you have a right by God Almighty under God's laws to defend your people. That's what it is all about. Rule number two then is based on the idea that you are to have only a self-defense posture and you are to avenge Adamic blood. When we as an Israelite nation are attacked in any way or if the blood of any of our people is shed in the process, we have the right given to us by the Lord of hosts to go to war. It doesn't make any difference what the do-gooders say. As Peter and the other apostles said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Rule number one and number two become the basis for the principles of warfare and the other rules we have yet to discuss. So one and two are the, the basis of the principles. Now there is a perfect example of how God wants his people, Israel, to act 
and behave when an unrighteous act of aggression is, has taken place against his people. Chapters 19, 20, and 21 of the book of Judges describes it in great detail. The story is a simple story, but it is in great detail. It is a must in your reading, and you must read it, and you should do it very shortly uh, while the thoughts of this message are fresh in your mind. Chapters 19, 20, and 21 of the book of Judges. The third rule of war is the offer of peace. And this is most important. We must offer peace. In Deuteronomy chapter 20 and in verse, verse 10, we read this. When thou comest nigh into a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. And in verse 12, and if it will make no peace with thee, but will have war against thee, then thou shalt besiege it. An example of this occurred very recently in Georgia. Perhaps it was an example in reverse, but the principle was exactly the same. I read this from Richard Hoskins' Portfolios Investment Advisory, dated December 2, 1985. <clears throat> and Richard Hoskins is the gentleman who wrote War Cycles, Peace Cycles, and I will go from there. An illiterate black farmer, Oscar Lorick, fell behind on his payments. He owed $112,000. The bank came and took all of his farm equipment. The other day, they came and gave him seven days to vacate his 79-acre farm. On November 15th of this year, 125 of his white neighbors who are also facing foreclosure in the near future on their farms, got their weapons and set up a perimeter around Mr. Lorick's farm. The first thing they did was to offer peace. You must offer peace. They vowed, to, however, to fight the bank agents trying to foreclose. Sheriff Edward Coley came unarmed. He came without weapons. He looked over the situation and went away. When questioned, he said this, I didn't start the situation and that it was out of his hands. The banking interests argued that Sheriff Coley's action encourages lawlessness, lawlessness across the nation. The sheriff is the highest elected in law enforcement officer in the county. And the next step is that of the governor of the state. The 125 farmers all know what happened to the farmer in the Midwest when he objected uh, to foreclosure. SWAT teams were brought in to do the foreclosing. His farmer friends there in the Midwest had stood beside him during the day. But when night came, they went home to tend their chores. And at that time, a SWAT team went in under cover of darkness and killed the protesting farmer while he was alone. Now we all know that that situation was that of Arthur Kirk there in Nebraska. The Georgia farmers didn't leave when night came. One of the defending farmers told me, and this is uh, Mr. Hoskins talking, that he was afraid. He said that when he went to help, he didn't know if he would leave in a box or not. He just knew that he had to go. And when he was going, he wasn't going to sleep at night once he was there. So he was afraid. The correct thing to do is to settle the question of usury foreclosure peacefully, if that is at all possible. However, a peaceful settlement must be according to law. Mr. Hoskins continues. It is a two-sided effort. Hundreds of millions of dollars ride on the outcome. Over the years, banks have uh, enacted laws, statute laws, to favor their foreclosing uh, tactics. They rely on these statutes. When their threats don't work in foreclosing procedures, the actual force is brought to bear by the sheriff. If this fails, the governor allows the state police to enter the scene, or he allows a 
SWAT team to be sent in. Practically, in the Georgia case, a SWAT team couldn't have handled the 125 armed farmers, most of whom were veterans of America's wars. They could teach the SWAT team something about fighting. Mr. Hoskins continues, the governor can then, if he chooses, call the National Guard to back them with tanks. This powerful force can kill and scatter the protesting farmers in a short time. Escalation of this sort isn't smart either. Besides killing voters, the drawback is that it is like swatting a hornet's nest. The hornets scatter and return and sting everyone concerned, including bystanders. This includes consenting politicians at all levels. It includes bank stockholders, liberal preachers, red front newspapermen, and so forth. Then there is the problem of guardsmen who will not fire on their own kinsmen. They may even turn their weapons on those who will. Now, that is the end of Mr. Hoskins' newsletter. There you have an example of what happens when you cry unto the Lord for deliverance and you act according to his rules. They offered peace. And you stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. The fourth rule is that we are not supposed to destroy land, food producing land in the conflict. We can find this rule in Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 19 and 20. When thou shalt besiege a city a long time in making war against it to take it, thou shalt not destroy the trees thereof by forcing an ax against them. For thou mayest eat of them, and thou shalt not cut them down to employ them in the siege. For the tree of the field is man's life. Only the trees which thou knowest that they be not trees for meat, thou shalt destroy and cut them down, and thou shalt build bulwarks against the city that maketh war with thee until it be subdued. You are not supposed to destroy any food producing land, any material in the food producing business, or any of the crops. This is a law of God. Now, the fifth rule for warfare is that of universal participation. This can be found even in the basic system of, law, of the law of God. In Leviticus chapter 24 and in verse 14, bring forth him that hath cursed without the camp and let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head and let all the congregation stone him. In Deuteronomy chapter 13 and in verse 9, we read this. But thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death and afterwards the hands of all the people. In Deuteronomy 17 and verse 7, the hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hands of all the people. So thou shalt put the evil away from among you. Many of our forefathers, not only in this Christian nation, but in others in Europe, were required to attend public hangings of the convicted criminals, and they were required to pass by the body and touch the body with their hands to show that they participated in the execution. Now, even if they disagreed with the sentence, they had to show agreement with the system of justice. In the three chapters of Judges that I suggest you read, you will find that when Israel was at war with Benjamin, and it was a defensive war, they were just and right in having that war. The city of Jabesh Gilead refused to supply any troops, and the city was therefore destroyed. Again in Judges chapter 5 and verse 23, Curse ye me, Rose, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help 
of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. In Judges 5 and chapter 11, and chapter 16 and 17 of Judges, the song of Deborah was sung against all those who failed to support Israel in war. The closer the Israelites were to the scene of the conflict, the more participation was expected from them. All Israelites in the immediate vicinity were expected to fight. Those further away could send only a few or as many as were actually needed. But there was the universal participation. Thus we, from that, have the basis for the militia, the true, genuine Israelite militia. The book of Numbers is relevant to the mustering of the militia. In fact, the word numbers is the same. It is synonymous with mustering. So numbers means musters. When you read the book of Numbers, you will find that the militia really reports downward to the people for leadership rather than upwards to the head of the government. Now that is the argument against the National Guard or the State Guard or the reserve system as being the militia. They all report upwards. And in today's near police state, the headquarters for that system is an organization called the Federal Emergency Management Administration, or FEMA. It is in that concept of organization that the SWAT teams with National Guard and State Guard backup is contemplated. Now, you can readily see that they look at you with big innocent eyes and say, I don't understand when you try to tell them and explain to them that the National Guard is not the militia. It is my opinion that they simply don't want to understand because it would be a complete reversal for the, from the system of justice and warfare that we should be doing. The book of Numbers or Musters is very explicit about how the militia is to elect their own officers from the ranks. Thus, they are reporting downward to the people who is and who is not required to fight and how they are to look to the Lord of hosts for guidance. They are supposed to read the Bible and read in that Bible how they are to fight that war. God is very specific in how we are supposed to use the elders of Israel for the instructors and the leaders. Now, you can readily see that if we did it God's way, we wouldn't have been in the war where we couldn't cross the Yalu River to take the war into the enemy's ha camp to destroy him. And you can readily see that we wouldn't be off somewhere in a rice paddy, a stinking rice paddy in Vietnam fighting an enemy with no intentions of winning. You can see that the leaders couldn't possibly have been dual loyalists, at least not for very long, could they? The sixth rule of war is the one that we understand the, and appreciate the least. You see, it is yet the most commonly used method in the Bible, in the Word of God, and yet we don't understand it. We don't discuss it. If you are out hiking and you come across a rattlesnake, you pick up a rock and you throw the rock attempting to hit the head of the rattlesnake. If you're a, uh, a scuba diver uh, in oceanic waters where octopuses roam and you come across an octopus, you don't take your knife. You're not instructed to take your knife and start cutting off arms. There's too many of them. You are instructed to take your knife and go for the head of the octopus. You see, ancient Israel knew this. Again, we turn to God's laws. God holds the leaders of society responsible for their actions. The leaders of society are the ones responsible, and God holds them directly accountable for their actions. The book of Judges, again, is very specific on this. It's a very powerful book, and it would do us all good to read it very, very thoroughly until we understood every minute detail of it. It gives us battle plans, the art of patience, the art of subterfuge, 
the art of strategy and guile. These are all important factors that we must learn if we are ever to be successful. It gives us, gives us examples of how one person, or at the very most, a few people, how they changed the history of Israel. Turn with me, if you will, please, to the book of Judges in chapter 3. And we will start reading in verse 12. Chapter 3 of Judges, verse 12. Here we see an example of how God uses one person to do his will, starting in verse 12. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. They sinned. And he gathered an Am, the children of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. That's Jericho. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer. Did you hear that? Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjaminite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. But Ehud made him a dagger, which, with, which had two edges and was a cubit in length, and that it was actually 12 inches long and not the standard cubit. This is a, a, a translational error there. And he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh, And he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. But when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. But he himself turned again from the quarries, and that would also be idols, that were by Gilgal, and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, Keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him, and Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he rose out of his seat, and Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the, belly, the blade. He must have been fat. So that he could not draw out the dagger out of his belly, and the dirt came out. Now, brother, sister, this is the word of God that we're reading. We must understand this. It's the same God that we find in Matthew 10 and in verse 34. Think not that I come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Then Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. When he was gone out, his servants came, and when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked. They said, Surely he covereth his feet in his summer chamber, and they tarried till they were ashamed. And behold, he opened not the doors of the parlor. There, uh, uh, therefore, they took a key and opened them. And behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. And Ehud escaped while they tarried and passed beyond the idols, the quarries, and escaped into Serath. And it came to pass when, it were, when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him from the mount and he before them, and he said unto them, Follow after me, for the Lord hath delivered your enemies, into, uh, the Moabites, into your hand. And they went down after him, and took the fords of Jordan toward Moab, and suffered not a man to pass over. They didn't allow anyone to pass over the Jordan. And they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty, and all men of valor, and there escaped not a man. 
So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the Lord had rest four score years. This is a very important message that we're reading here. There are many uh, examples of this. Jael killed Sisera. Samson killed the five lords of the Philistines. S Gideon killed Zeba, Oreb, Zeb, and Zalmunna. It was the single most prevalent method of fighting a war in Israel. And yet the practicality of it is so very, very obvious to us. It did away with the head, the enemy, that was responsible. And you see, in God's eyes, that was just. You go for the head. And therefore, it was just in his eyes. It is much more simpler in that great armies were not necessary, and it was much less costly, particularly in manpower. There wouldn't be Christian killing Christian. Now, the enemies of our people know this, and they know it very well. They have used it on numerous occasions in history. The assassination of the Prince of Austria involved us in World War I because President Lincoln dared to print $400 million in greenbacks and pay them into circulation. He was assassinated. And so it was with Joseph Kennedy, John Kennedy. If we go back through God's rules for warfare, we find that we just don't seem to be doing anything right anymore. Maybe the only exceptions are a few occasional affairs like the recent confrontation in Georgia. Now, I would analyze that to be because it was a group of dedicated Christian men who had a cause that was righteous in accordance with God's laws. And it was a group of men who were willing to put their lives on the line and to stand fast, therefore. And yet, God is patiently waiting. He has seen fit to disallow the enemies of our people to take away the weapons that exist in the hands of the true militia in the United States of America. It seems so amazing to me that no matter what they try to do, something always happens and stands in their way. It, he has even seen fit to give this militia more long guns in the hands of this militia than in all of the armies of the world put together. Now that is very important. It's good information to have. Now if we are to truly believe the analysis of Ezekiel 38 and 39 as presented by most of our leading ministers of today, and men like Reverend Pitts in his message to Congress in the last century, then we will know for sure that the great day of the Lord is here and now. The enemies of our people have already thought an evil thought. The enemies have already penetrated this great Christian land and have taken her for a spoil. But if we are going to sit here like whimpering puppies until we all learn one thing, the God's rule number one for warfare, and that is our people have to get right with God. We have to understand His Word. And we're so far from this. Our churches are taking us away from it instead of toward it. We have to have faith in Him. We have to learn patience. We have to become physically and mentally qualified. And I mean that in the sincerest way. We have to realize that God promises us victory. We must become dedicated. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. For with thee will I break in pieces the nation, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. Five of you shall chase an hundred, and an hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. Then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies, and an adversary unto thine adversaries, and mine angel shall go before thee. I'd like to read or close in just a kind of a poem that Mr. Frederick Douglass wrote in the last century, 1857. He says this, Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation 
are men who with, want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its waters. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, it never will. Find out just what people will submit to, and you have found out the exact opposite of in, uh, amount of injustice. You will have found out the exact amount of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And they will con they, these will continue until they are resisted with either words or blows or with both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. And that was by Frederick Douglass in 1857. God be with each and every one of us. Strengthen us and deliver us. Thank you so very much.